Welcome everyone to the Lawyers Committee and the Truth Action Project program. Today's program is called Recognizing and Pushing Back the Post-9-11 Police State. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Graham McQueen, and Graham is a uh, retired professor of religious studies at McMaster University, Ontario, where he taught from 1974 to 2003. He was also the founder and director of the Center for Peace Studies at McMaster and was active in several war zones. He has served as a co-editor of the Journal of 9-11 Studies, an organizer at the Toronto hearings on 9-11 and a member of the 9-11 Consensus Panel. Uh, Graham will speak on attacking Congress with weapons of mass destruction, a decisive moment in the fraudulent, fraudulent war on terror. Thanks, Graham. Thank you, Dave. Can everyone hear me? Good. Okay, and the time is now. Sorry, I'm just trying to figure it's, out how long. Right. I... You have it's three thirty-eight. You have uh, but fifteen minutes to uh, three fifty-three. Got it sorted. Thank you very much. Sure. Well, everybody, thank you for allowing me to be here. I'm honored to speak with all these wonderful people. I was also honored to serve on the Anthrax Investigation Subcommittee of the Lawyers Committee on 9-11 Inquiry. I had in 2014 published a little book on the anthrax attacks, which is called The 2001 Anthrax Deception. And I guess that's why I was asked to join the subcommittee, but I've been happy, very happy to see that the, the committee is able to go beyond much of what I found. Uh, there are many documents uncovered and affidavits acquired and so on that I did not have. And so I'm delighted to be part of this important work. I follow that with a disclaimer. I'm speaking for myself here, not for the Lawyers Committee. I've been at this work for decades and um, I have been working away um, in my workshop, so to speak, on the global war on terror and its rotten foundations. And today, I want to look at, a, I want to take a step back, even though I'm interested in the details of the anthrax attacks, I want to take a step back in order to say something that will directly uh, um, be relevant to our general theme today of pushing back this dangerously imminent police state. We know there are lots of pressures on elected legislatures and it's something we all have to worry about, but there's one that's particularly crude, particularly gross, and that is the physical intimidation of legislatures, not just in the United States, but in various parts of the world. Indeed, I'm not from the United States, I'm a Canadian, and I'm gonna start off the two cases from Canada, after which I will mention two cases from the US. I wanna take these four cases because I wanna argue there's a pattern here. It's a very dangerous pattern. We gotta understand it, we gotta recognize it. I believe that these legislatures in the world not only can't protect us, they cannot even protect themselves. And that's a theme. Okay, so um, I'll begin with the Canadian cases. We had two successive cases of intimidation of legislatures in 2013, the first, 2014, the second. I want to read you a brief quotation relevant to this matter. This will start me off. At 2.30 p.m. to cries of police, my assistant opens the office's main door. He comes face to face with soldiers aiming their machine guns at him and ordering him to put his hands in the air. One by one, our doors are opened and the soldiers point their guns at my assistants who exit their offices, hands in the air as if they were criminals. The door we go through is destroyed. Glass has exploded all over the floor. The door across the hallway has also been knocked in. Glass litters the hallway. I sit near the open window, I'm breathing, but stunned. Parliament is in the hands of the armed forces. So that's not a script from a movie, that's uh, the words of Canadian Senator Céline Hervé Payette, referring to events of October 22nd, 2014 in Canada, the second and larger of these cases of intimidation of legislatures. 
Briefly then, the first one, 2014, involved two so-called homegrown terrorists who had self-converted to Islam and happened to be impoverished drug addicts. The RCMP, our federal police, found it useful to get hold of these people and turn them via undercover officers into serious terrorists. It was a long and difficult task because these poor people really were not the stuff of terrorism. But they did it and they spent a lot of money on, on it. And the entire operation from beginning to end was an RCMP production. They even produced a little pathetic martyrdom video and supplied the scary black flag with, with uh, Arabic writing behind it. That was all done by the RCMP. This all came out in the court case when the police uh, brought charges against these two individuals, hoping to put them away for a couple of decades for terrorism. You know about these cases, the FBI does them all the time and generally they are put away, but this time there was an honest judge who caught the case, Justice Catherine Bruce. She was appalled at the obvious entrapment of these individuals and threw the case out, technically put a stay on proceedings. And this was a black eye for the RCMP. The next year, 2014, I would speculate that the lesson had been learned if you don't have a dead perpetrator, you may have a court case. If you have a court case, there's always the chance a decent person might show up and make sure the truth is made clear. So in 2014, the perpetrator or alleged perpetrator, Michael Zahaf Bibo, another drug addicted, um, self-converted, uh, domestic homegrown terrorist from Vancouver, just like the first two, managed to shoot a soldier at the war memorial in our capital city, Ottawa, and then somehow, with his rifle, get across the street and run into the front door of the House of Parliament, where he ran down the hall with his loaded weapon, shooting just yards from the Prime Minister and his caucus. Before being brought down, we are told, in a hail of bullets, dying with 31 9 millimeter caliber bullets in his body, now this was considered the worst security breach in Canadian history on Parliament Hill. And Canadians were shocked to see video footage of it on their nightly news. Typically Canadians are bored by what happens in Parliament. This was an exception. I have studied both of these cases and I have concluded, even though I can't convince you of this here, that they were both police operations. The first one, obviously, we don't even need to prove that, but the second one, 2014, also. I wrote a pamphlet of about, I don't know, 85 pages after studying this case. It's called the, two, the October 22nd, 2014 Ottawa shootings. Why Canadians need a public inquiry? Well, we didn't get a public inquiry and we didn't get a parliamentary inquiry. And we didn't even get a provincial coroner's report on the two deaths. All we got are a series of police reports that refuse even to ask the main questions, let alone answer them. You're gonna to have to take my word for it here. I'm afraid that this is another case where the perpetrator was handled by police. I'll give you just one example of why I think that. The RCMP commissioner said right after this happened, we were caught off guard. We had no warning. This was an obvious lie. There were at least five warnings, some of them specific and actionable. And there was also a practice session done a couple of weeks before the event. Well, what these were useful for me in doing is waking up. I woke up to a pattern, namely police inspired and handled cases of putting the most brutal pressure on legislatures, physically intimidating. This is who we are. This is what we can do to you whenever we want. That's the message. And there were quite specific things that were achieved through this. It's not just a general pattern of bullying and dominance. Especially in the case of the 2014 attack, we had two important bills passed by the legislature, Bill C-13 and Bill C-51, both of which handed over increased power 
to spy agencies and police and security forces generally in Canada at the expense of citizens. Now, having seen this pattern, I then looked anew at what I had already been studying, the 9-11 attacks and the anthrax attacks, and I hope you will come with me now to the United States as we have another look at those attacks from this perspective. On 9-11, says Tom Daschle, Senate Majority Leader, he was watching TV at 10.30 in the morning in the Capitol building, watching the attacks unfold, when a security officer ran into the room and said, Senator, we have to evacuate the entire building. We're told a plane is headed our way. And so all members, of the, all everyone in the Capitol building uh, evacuated helter-skelter with no plan, according to Daschle. He says it was total chaos. Off they went into the four directions. Intimidated, yes, intimidated. They timidly gathered later in the day on the steps of the Capitol building to hug each other, sing God bless America, and give a series of little brave speeches about how we will not be intimidated. But they were intimidated. And the results of this, just as in the Canadian case, are very clear. Three days later, September 14th, they passed a bill authorizing the use of force against whatever country the president, whatever party, the president decided had been responsible for the 9-11 attacks. This was handing over a lot of power, not just to invade and destroy countries, but also to give the president powers as commander in chief which he didn't have previously. And it, it marks a new era in the war on terror. Now, as has already been said, very shortly after the 9-11 attacks, the anthrax attacks unfolded. And the clear thing here, the clear aim here was to use the attacks and even the threat of the attacks to pass the Patriot Act. Ashcroft introduced the Patriot Act very shortly after 9-11 and essentially said we want it passed right away, within a few days. But there were people who resisted that, who slowed it down. And eventually, Ashcroft, if you look at his speeches of the time, he keeps haranguing the Democrats for slowing this down. Every day that goes by without the passage of this bill makes us closer to another terrorist attack. Finally, on September 30th, it all comes out. Um, the New York Times on its front page says, experts say US may be vulnerable to a germ attack. How interesting because the anthrax had not been diagnosed in anybody at that point. They weren't diagnosed until three days later, October 3rd. But the, on the same day, September 30th, there was a serious coordinated administration official uh, initiative and Andrew Card, White House Chief of Staff said, quote, terrorist organizations like Al Qaeda have probably found the means to use biological or chemical warfare. Rumsfeld said terrorists could be equipped by their state sponsors with weapons of mass destruction. Tommy Thompson, Secretary of Health and Human Services spoke of, and this is on CBS, this is a direct quote, a bioterrorism attack. Well, that's fascinating since anthrax was supposedly not known to be on the scene by anyone. And one of the things all these gentlemen wanted to support was the passage of the Patriot Act by a specific date, namely October 5th. And here you have, this timeline is very important. Cheney announced the October 5th deadline and it was publicly reported in the Washington Post. It was not a secret. There were two senators, and again, you can read the Washington Post, which covered this in real time. They said the October 5th deadline will be missed. And it will be missed because of the blockage of two Democratic senators, Tom Daschle and Patrick Leahy. Well, guess what? The deadline was missed on October 5th, and somewhere between October 6th and 9th, Two letters were put in the mail to Tom Daschle and Patrick Leahy, containing extremely sophisticated and potentially lethal anthrax spores. Now, of course, it had the uh, desired effect, which is to panic people, to hurry up the passage of the act. 
As Colbert King said in the Washington Post, anthrax caused the House of Representatives to flee town. It closed Senate office buildings, unprecedented actions. And of course, it also caused the passage of the USA Patriot Act. In other words, it intimidated an elected legislature. That's the pattern. And those are the four cases I wanted to lay out for you. It seems to me this is extremely dangerous. It seems the danger continues. Every legislature in the world at the moment is weakened through this pandemic. We don't know if they'll get their power after the pandemic is over. I conclude there by uh, affirming this pattern, this anti-democratic pattern, which is part of what I fear may be a coming police state. And I want to say finally, in conclusion, people often say, well, what can we do? In this case, there's something quite specific. I hope you will support the Lawyers Committee. Uh, if you haven't already read their petition for a grand jury on 9-11, please do so. And the two petitions they're now producing, one to Congress and one for a new grand jury on anthrax, could be crucial in opening the door to uh, what's really going on in this war on terror. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. Thank you very much.